Sports card pricing is highly illogical, and that is why predictive pricing models are a waste of your time. Allow me to explain. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Data Dive powered by Market Movers. My name is Tyler Nethercott, better known as Teapot, and I'm gonna be honest, I'm a little bit fired up today. I'm freshly back from the Mint Collective in Las Vegas, where I had a great time running into so many hobby friends, professionals, movers, and shakers. And Friday, we had an awesome lineup of talks, breakout sessions put on by some of the most tenured folks in the hobby. Saturday was the card show, where instead of setting up our own Market Movers booth, we had the opportunity to walk the floor and talk to everyone about the state of the hobby and the challenges that they're facing. So I'm fired up in a good way and I'm energized, but I'm also fired up in a little bit of a feisty way, a little disturbed by some of the frustrations vented to me while I was at the show. See, one of the things that had brought up to me the most at the show was something like this. Hey, Teapot, I know your product is Market Movers. Have you ever used such and such an app? I tried it. It gave me a predicted value and it was way off. Or I looked at the sales history for some cards and the results it matched were way off. I had at least eight different apps and websites mentioned to me at the show with users concern, uh, expressing huge concerns that the results were off and that the predicted price was even worse. So today I'm breaking down the free market economy that is the world of sports cards. Frankly, it's the wild, wild west and inadequate predictive pricing models are causing mass confusion and frustration at card shows and online for dealers, for buyers, for everyone involved. I'm not in the business of bashing other companies. If you followed me on this channel for a long time, you know that uh, you know following my personal Instagram or even our Market Movers Instagram, we have thoughts of never speaking ill of others and being a proponent of forgiving and giving the benefit of the doubt. So my goal today isn't as much to fire shots at any one other competitor or company, but rather to try to explain our vision and our purpose with Market Movers and why I'm incredibly confident that we have the best overall data philosophy with respect to how we add cards and how we are scaling our database. And in all honesty, this isn't going to be like an ad bit for Market Movers as much as just an honest discussion about why accurately predicting and deriving card values is something of a fool's errand and that's the main reason why we have opted here at Market Movers not to do it and instead to empower our users with the data to make their own decisions. So with all that being said, let's get into the data. Okay, so I'm gonna jump back and forth between a spreadsheet with a bunch of numbers that might be somewhat confusing and I'll do my best to walk you through that and then Market Movers in some different screens. And I'm taking this scenario and the scenario is somebody walks up to you and they say, hey, I've got this Steph Curry PSA 9 2021 Kaboom from Crown Royale, and I don't know what to price it at. It last sold all the way back in November. That's 150 days ago, uh, November 6, 2022. It sold for 1.92K, but there aren't any recent sales comps since then. It's been a long time since then. A lot of things have changed. We're nearing the playoffs. You know, the Warriors aren't exactly favorites like they were last year. So what should I price this card at? And I'm gonna talk through the different ways that you can try to extrapolate this and break down you know, where some of the confusion comes from with people trying to price cards. Before I do that, let me explain. Basically, there are so many different independent factors that could play in and weigh into how you compare a card. In this case today, I'm gonna to show four different things. And I'll, like I said, I'll walk you through those. But what I've seen from other predictive pricing models is that they don't seem to take all those factors into account. They maybe anchor it to one thing, like how has a player's prices changed or to a stratus of cards. And they say, you know, high-end cards have done this or something else even more occult and hidden from the user. You just see a number and then it's like, this is what the card's worth. And you're going, well, what's that based on? And you have no visibility to how they're breaking that down. So let's kind of walk through this. So like in this case, you've got the PSA 9, at 1.92K. You've got the PSA 10 that sold most recently on April 2nd, just a, you know, a few days ago, for 1.94K. Now, isn't that interesting? Obviously, we know there's a huge gap usually between nines and tens. Not so here if you just were to look at these two prices. And then you've got a raw one that sold back on uh, March 15th, so about a month ago, and that one sold for 1.13K. <clears throat> so if we jump over and I take a look at this, and I say, okay, how do I wanna you know, try to extrapolate this? <clears throat> What's a usual uh, multiplier here? 
Well, I can look at uh, you know these price charts and intelligence reports and say, what are PSA 10s versus PSA 9s on average across this entire set selling for? So that's what I did. I'm using grade ratios and I'm looking at this particular set and I can see scrolling down, I've got you know, a fair number of data points here from the last 30 days to see that the average multiplier here is two to one. Now the beautiful thing about this as you scroll down is you see even within this, all the variation. So if you were to apply this ratio of two to one for a 10 to a nine on Kabooms, to this James Harden card, or to this Cam Reddish card, or to this Trey Young card, that's not what they actually sold for. So this reveals an interesting data point that you can try to use, but also the proof within each individual line item that there's only really one card, maybe two cards, the Donovan Mitchell and the Pete Maravich, that actually hold to that principle, whereas the rest of them are kind of all over the place. But you see a two to one ratio on average. Uh, you could use the median at 1.7 as well. And then I can jump over and look at the same thing on the PSA 9 to raw ratio and see that that's 1.5. So I jump back to the spreadsheet, right? And I say, okay, I know that this PSA 10 sold for 1890. I'm gonna divide that by two. But then that says that my raw or my PSA 9 kaboom should only be worth $945. That doesn't seem very helpful. I, that's definitely not what it's worth, right? Well, what about the raw sold for 1130? I'm gonna divide it by 0.66, which is the opposite of 1.5, the multiplier. That says it should be worth $1,700. That's nearly double. That's a complete you know, price swing in that direction. And so this again can be useful. I've obviously done videos in the past talking about using grade ratios and hoping that the market sort of catches up and also where there's arbitrage opportunities to crack and cross. It's valuable information, but it's not something that the free market finds themselves beholden to. Nobody's gonna go, oh gee, you know, now that I see that this average ratio is this on scale, I better price my card lower for you or I bet you better pay me more for this. At the end of the day, it's gonna be whatever that next buyer is willing to pay. So we'll start with these two data points, $945 and $1712. Now what else might we look at? Well, you can look at what has uh, Steph Curry's prices done in that time frame since the last PSA 9 sold. And really, like I said, it's 150 days, so we don't have that you know, data. We have the last 90 days, and we have the last 180 days. And why do we not have a custom time frame on here? Because we have millions and millions of transactions flowing through market movers. We have 1.5 million cards in the database now. This is not a data warehouse type you know, scenario where you wanna wait. I used to run BI intel, you know, intelligence reports at my last company. It would take 10 minutes for it to spit out all the data. We're trying to keep the app performance, so we pre-compute these stats every day when the new data comes in. So we see 90 days, his prices are down 3.3%. 180 days, down 16.8%. That's a really big difference. So how can we derive that? So I'll show you this here. Again, you've got this 150-day time frame, last value 1920. So we would say if it's down 3.3%, it's at 18.57. If it's down 16.8%, it's down to 15.97. Now, since it's somewhere in between, we're starting to see a pattern here, right? Between these three numbers, actually this 17.12, I'm feeling pretty good about in terms of a price. This one, this was some kind of a fluke with this 18.90 PSA 10. Frankly, it seems like somebody got a good deal. These three numbers are starting to look a lot more reasonable. Okay, the next thing you can do, you can find other players and you can see what did their cards sell for and what are the multipliers on the other grades of those players to try to extrapolate. Again, here's sort of a player and grade comparison, right? So I've got LeBron and I've got his PSA 10 Kaboom sold for 2.71K on uh, March 9th. And then I've got the Steph PSA 10 that sold for 1.87K. Now it's interesting, right? Because I said that that PSA 10 looked like a steal on the Steph, but then if that's a steal on the Steph, and the LeBron only went for 2.71K, that also seems like a steal on the LeBron. Again, you're seeing sort of like the cognitive dissonance in the marketplace with these prices where people focus on one card in a specific grade and they just put in their number of what they're willing to pay for it. They don't always look at what did the nine go for? What did the eight go for? What did the raw go for? What did so-and-so go for? These are things where if you were thinking logically anchoring these data points to other things, you'd say, okay, this is how it should work. It's not how the free market works. So you've got a multiplier here of 1.45K, right? And then I've got a, a multiplier on these tray cards of 0.5 on average, but it's 0.72 and 
and 0.35. So what did I do? PSA 10 to PSA 10, raw to raw. And even here, you see a big difference in these multipliers between these two uh, players and cards. So I come over here, I'm gonna expand this for you, and I see the player multiplier. So here's, here's the 10, it's just to show what the multiplier was on the 10, 10, and raw. And then this is the value of the PSA 9 of those respective cards for uh, LeBron and for Trey. So these are the PSA 9 values, uh, 1.08K and $888. So I'm gonna to try to extrapolate those, and I'm gonna do the, the math, divide. Again, here's another weird one. It's that 10 value with the Steph, and also with the LeBron that's causing issues. It says it should be only $745. The Trey says it should be 1233. But then the Raw says it should be 2537. So all of this to me is looking like, throw it out the window. There are many instances where this type of math, the player multiplier and doing that comparison can be the best one. It can, it can make a lot of sense, especially when you're comparing apples to apples with players from the same rookie class, like Zion to Ja, or Luca to Shea or Trey, those types of c comparisons. But in this case, when it's you know different tiers of player, it probably doesn't work the best. And this is why you wouldn't you know, necessarily be able to bake this into some kind of a predictive pricing algorithm. Okay, so the final comparison that I wanna look at here is comparing different variations, different things from sets. I tried to find one that is somewhat rare, uh, you know, not a like base card comparison. And so this mosaic stained glass, Steph's card sold in a PSA 9 on April 2nd for $163. So I jump over to intelligence reports, I'm on the variation ratios, and I put in 2021 Kabooms versus 2021 Stained Glass, and I'm looking at all grades, comparing the same grade of different players, and I can see that Giannis sold for a 7.3x multiplier, whereas down at the bottom I've got KD, only a 3.6x multiplier. All this works out to a 5.7 average. And then I can find Steph in particular, his PSA 10 multiplier, 4.43. His raw multiplier is 6.2. Somewhere in between that definitely looks like that 5.7 number. So if I jump over here, I can see this PSA 10, the multiplier is 4.43. The average for that whole data set, really kind of for Steph 2, 5.7, and then raw 6.2. Here was his PSA 9 value from the stained glass. But again, the math really here isn't checking out. I've got $722, $929, $1,011. So I'm left here, if I show this data range, right? with a massive swing, the high value predicted, if you were using the Trey Young you know, raw and trying to extrapolate that way, $2,500. We can safely throw that out and say there's no way. If Steph's cards we know have come down in price over time, and this card last sold 150 days ago for 1920, this is definitely not the price. The low at $722, well, there's no way that's the price either, why? Because this one just sold for 1130 a month ago I doubt that a PSA 9 is going to sell for $400 below that. So we get into the median and the average at $1,121 and $1,328. You might say somewhere in this price range, you know, $1,200, something like that. But ultimately, this is where the debate's going to come in between buyer and seller. I might look at all these data points on a higher end card. If I'm really, you know, if this is a big deal to me to consider spending $1,200, $1,500 on a card. I could see somebody pulling all this data out of market movers and looking at these comparisons and saying, well, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? At the end of the day, you're naturally gonna have the dealer, the person selling the card floating up here in the $1,700 range, and you're gonna have the buyer up here at the $900, you know, $950 range debating over this, and many times they're not gonna be able to come to an agreement. The real price of the card, and I've talked about this in the past, is what somebody is willing to pay for the card. The only way to find out is to put it on an auction or to put it in your showcase with a price and see if somebody bites or to put it on you know, one of the marketplaces, eBay or something, my slabs or whatever, and list it and see if somebody buys it. That's the price of the card and no amount of predictive analytics because there's so many different data points can predict it and no singular data point can predict it. Now, in the future, down the road, I may look to partner with some of you with the community, with people on our team to come up with a hybrid approach and to allow you to flex some of these values, to weight them differently, to build your own predictive pricing model. But we're certainly not gonna tell you what the market mover's value is of a card. We're just not gonna do that. So look, 
Predictive pricing, I just don't think it's possible with any measure of accuracy the way the market currently is. In order for predictive analytics to work, users would have to rely on those numbers to stick to the prices they're willing to pay. It's sort of like the chicken and an egg paradox, right? And right now there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people buying sports cards every month, the vast majority of whom, of those people, do so without paying any mind to some logical algorithm of what a card should be worth. Instead, they act on some combination of instinct, FOMO, excitement, ignorance, emotion, speculation, or of course, last comp. So while we have access to millions of records in our database, and we could build a highly convoluted predictive pricing model, none unlike the sample of what I showed today, it still frankly wouldn't be helpful and it would probably be somewhat harmful. Just like being five to 75% accurate on your models, being promoted by other apps really aren't helpful. In fact, I would say they're highly detrimental and they cause a lot of tension between buyers and sellers. So what do you think of all of this? Let me know down in the comments. If you wanna get this data, visit marketmoversapp.com and use promo code DIVE to get the first seven days and come up with your own prices and decide and then make a decision. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, happy investing, keep on collecting and make sure to have fun.